Hello and uh, welcome to uh, live from the Hammersmith. Uh, my name is Justin Davis. I'm an interventional cardiologist here at uh, Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. And it's uh, a pleasure to bring you another of the live from the Hammersmith uh, series. And this uh, week we're in partnership with Radliff Cardiology uh, in combination with my uh, senior colleague, Dr. Iqbal Malik. So for those of you who uh, have seen these uh, series before, uh, you know that uh, we try and uh, evolve uh, clinical practice uh, through rigorous uh, assessment of the data and advancing that uh, into clinical practice. And today essentially we're going to be using uh, two new techniques. So we're going to be using the IFR technique and we're going to be using the IFR scout technique. Uh, and we're going to be showing how we can integrate those into uh, routine clinical practice in a very, very uh, interesting patient that we have for you today. So the concepts of, uh, uh, of life from the hamster, though I said, is essentially a fusion of uh, clinical practice, uh, evidence, uh, and hopefully with an aim of fusing these two together in a, in a live case environment to uh, improvement in patient uh, outcomes. So without further ado, it's probably worth us looking at the case we're going to do uh, today. Uh, Six reminded me already, I can see that uh, there's an opportunity in all of these uh, uh, cases for you to feed back to us and you can see uh, on the slide deck now that uh, if you have got questions for us please fire them over uh, Twitter they'll be picked up and we'll try and interlude these with uh, the uh, dialogue that we have during the case okay great so let's have a look at this case uh, that we've got for you today so it's a 59 year old uh, male gentleman who's kindly agreed to come in uh, for the the, uh, the filming today. Um, he's obviously got extensive coronary disease while he's here. He uh, has symptoms of exertional breathlessness. He's a smoker. Uh, he has no other risk factors for a coronary artery disease. Uh, an echo uh, showed good uh, left ventricular systolic function. And he's had a CT uh, calcium score which showed three vessel disease with a high uh, calcium score. So he had a coronary angiogram uh, a few weeks ago now uh, which is of course why he's here, uh, confirmed the results of the CT scan that he did have diffuse disease. But he actually is a very, very interesting uh, patient from an educational perspective because he's one of these gentlemen who actually often when you look at the angiogram, you're left with more questions uh, than you actually have answers. So you can see disease and you're really wondering uh, if the disease is uh, significant uh, or not. And actually, so we took this a step further and we actually uh, asked all of our uh, team here at Imperial, we showed them the angiogram images and we said, in these cases, you know, what would you do? Uh, how would you treat this patient? What do you think the best management is? How significant do you think uh, these lesions are? And, uh, and we got their viewpoint. Now, of course, this is similar to studies that you may have seen, such as the R3F study from Eric Van Bell in France and the ripcord study. Um, but again, it was our own uh, local in-house experience of what we would do managing these, uh, uh, these set of arteries. If we can see the um, angiogram first, you'll see that uh, this is what we got. So the baseline said was done a few weeks ago in March. Uh, you can see that from these left-sided pictures, there's what looks like a, a tight uh, lesion in the obtuse marginal branch. There's a, perhaps a hint of some LAD disease. And as we move through the angiogram slides, you'll see that perhaps there's more disease at the LED diagonal bifurcation. Perhaps there's evidence of uh, a little muscle bridge, uh, not closing the, the artery down completely, but evidence of a muscle bridge there. Uh, and if you go to the right system here, you can see that the disease here is a little bit more extensive. You can see that there's disease in the proximal part of the vessel, and it extends further uh, distally as well. So, as I said, lots of questions, uh, and we thought it would be fun, uh, as this was going to be a live case transmission, to see what people thought. Uh, and these, of course, are a, a range of uh, people who are used to managing and dealing uh, with patients with uh, extensive coronary disease on a day-by-day -day basis. And if we can see these results, you'll see that uh, it was, a, as I said, a whole range of, of uh, of uh, the team were asked, uh, different skill levels uh, from consultant grade to attending grade all the way down uh, to our fellows and some of our trainees were asked as well to give, give their opinion. And, and as you'd expect, as, we, as we've seen uh, from the literature, that uh, you get a wide range of opinions. So uh, I can hear Iqbal chuffling to my left here because 
if you look at these uh, these slides here, you see that uh, the range of opinions here really does uh, differ, and there doesn't necessarily uh, seem to be any hard and fast uh, rule there with regards to the seniority of the person giving the opinion. So you see the LED on here could range anywhere between 40 and 70 percent, the right coronary artery anywhere again between 40 and maybe 75 percent, and the OM1 anywhere between about 30 percent going all the way up to about 85 percent. So huge range of opinions. Now if we, if we look ahead and, and what these, uh, these uh, people thought would be the best approach to managing uh, these patients, it's very interesting. We perform a lot of physiology in the center. Perhaps you'd get a different result from different centers, but what you can certainly see here is that in more than 50% of the time, the operators would fall back to the use of physiology. So the LED, there's a lot of potential here for using physiology according to the viewpoints of the operator. Uh, right coronary artery again, and uh, the obtuse marginal, perhaps, a lesion which angiographically looked most significant, uh, about 50% of people were keen to uh, move ahead with physiology. And uh, over and above that, you can see, as is ever the case, that uh, some operators wanted to just jump in straight away to PCI, both for the OM and the right coronary artery, and then there's some who f felt that medical therapy more, may be more appropriate. So a real bread and butter uh, case, intermediate disease, uh, diffusely spread throughout this patient's um, uh, arteries. So if we look at the, uh, the opinions that you got uh, from uh, our colleagues here, you can see that uh, you know, when asked if the physiology was going to be positive or negative, you can see maybe there's a slight trend to the right coronary artery being negative, the OM1 being positive. The LED here is very, very equivocal. And we've really come to learn that people who benefit most from stenting really do if you're stenting a lesion which is going to see a significant improvement in flow afterwards. So we really want to be certain before we go um, uh, implanting stents into patients. So Iqbal, you, you, you came in and started the case and took some nice diagnostic pictures for us a few minutes ago. Yeah. And perhaps you want to review them, maybe starting with the left system and then move on to the right system. And to say, particularly with the right system, what, what we found and what important teaching points there are there. Okay, thanks very much, Justin. And uh, I look forward to going through this case with you. I think uh, the key clinical point to bring out, this gentleman's not diabetic. Mm -hmm. And so I think the key to it is uh, now to look at the angiogram in that light. So can we play the, uh, the left coronary shot, please? Okay, so let's do the first of the left coronary shots. Start at the top of the angiogram. Uh, away we go. Let's play that, June. Uh, so not the roadmaps, but the uh, angiogram. That's it. Okay, so that's the right. So can we flick past? Okay, and let's just get to the left coronary shots. Okay, so um, we started with an EBU35 guide catheter. It's important to give nitrates, isn't it? I, I must say, I, I don't like even a diagnostic angiogram being done without nitrates being given. The size of the vessel changes. And I think on that, I think we can appreciate that the obtuse marginal does look like a significant lesion angiographically at least. So let's move on. And so we're trying now to open up that LED diagonal bifurcation. Now on this view, I think what is very clear is that there is a profound muscle bridge, isn't there? You mm -hmm. can see that in the, in the distal LED. And uh, that's really clamping things down. And that's something I'm going to leave entirely alone. We know that stenting and surgery is very bad for muscle bridges. Uh, so uh, it may affect our physiology, however, uh, if there's a clamping down of the artery. But of course, this clamping is in systole, and especially with IFR, uh, our diagnostic information is in diastole, so hopefully it won't affect the IFR. So uh, move forward, and let's see if we can get a better picture of that bifurcation. So there is an interesting point here, because when I was looking at the pressure traces, I thought that perhaps the dichrotic notch was absent, and so I've deliberately pulled the guide caster back a little to make sure there isn't an osteal stenosis. And uh, so that's why you've got a non-selective shot. And I think there's some atheroma there, but I think it's probably the angle of the guide caster that caused that little pressure phenomenon. So let's move on. Okay, and so on this view again, you know, we're in the grey zone, aren't we, about whether that LED diagonal bifurcation really needs doing or not. And that's what my colleagues thought as well. So move on. And this view, I think if we sort of uh, take a look at that, I just begin to get my eye dragged to the ostium of the diagonal yeah. as maybe a little bit tighter than the main LAD, but it's certainly hazy at that bifurcation. And uh, I think, to be honest, w the diagnostic angiogram went around the pictures. We've taken a few more pictures. I don't think more pictures are going to be the answer, and I think this is why physiology is going to be very important here. So I mean, this is a, a great illustration here uh, that Iqbal's described to us of, of a 
changing the vessel caliber with nitrates, and also perhaps a case where actually you could probably learn more from physiology than the angiography alone. You've got a, almost a spider's web of, of vessels there, and it's very, very difficult to get a good view which totally unravels uh, the arteries as best as you'd want. The heart's certainly moving around quite a bit, which further uh, makes this diff complex as well. So what did you find in the right? Okay, so let's move off to the right. So let's go forwards. Okay, so this is the right coronary artery, again taken with nitrates. And what I'm taken by is, it looks bigger, doesn't it, yeah. than, the, uh, than the pictures that the diagnostic angiogram had. So um, I'm more comfortable about the proximal part of the right not being too diseased. I'm comfortable that the distal vessel is actually a pretty decent sized vessel. But what we can appreciate on the curve just beyond the RV branch is that there does seem to be there's some atheromatous plaque there. Again, I'd say moderate, certainly not one to go directly for stenting, in particular because it's on a double chicane so stenting would carry some risk so uh, let's move on and so this is a pressure wire that I'm taking down the vessel now the pressure wires from sort of five six years ago I think that would have been a real challenge getting down here but I think the the Verato wire that we're using today uh, it behaves much more like an angioplasty mm -hmm. one I'm much more comfortable taking it through the chicane go, go forwards and so I found a side branch uh, go forwards Eventually, uh, I managed to get down distally. And so, uh, around about there, where I've covered the area of interest, which is just around about that RV branch, I was happy to take uh, an IFR. Reading. So, let me just stop you there before we look at the IFR. So, so essentially, you know, the... The real question here, as I see it, is if we're not giving nitrates and making these physiology measurements, as may be the case in the first set of angiograms we had from March, you could actually just be measuring the effect of the vessel not being at its maximum epicardial diameter. Mm. So it's absolutely crucial to making good quality measurements and reliable measurements and robust measurements that you administer nitrates, uh, wait a f 20 seconds for the effect to take place to make sure you've got maximum epicardial uh, vasodilatation. And if you do that, then often the, the, the value you get may be very different from what you may expect. So what did you find on the, on the IFR? Okay, so uh, when we've taken the IFR reading there, so we're set up to give adenosine if we were in the grey zone, but I think we're not in the grey zone because the IFR was 0 0.94, and then you know we decided to repeat it again, although we don't normally do that, and it was 0 0.95. Fine. So uh, this I would class as a negative IFR. Okay, that's good. So you, you very quickly wired down, gave the nitrates, you made your measurement, you've confirmed that this is a very normal IFR, and then what you want to do is you use the RFR scout mm. just to do a pullback. Now this is not something we'd normally uh, always do if the value is very negative because you're not really going to be putting a stent in. You're really doing that, I suppose, in this situation just to show the spatial resolution yeah. of this technique. And so what did you, what, what okay, can you describe so for us there? Uh, so if we can see the physiology screen now, then uh, the IFR pullback is done just manually. So I've taken a steady pullback through, and actually we can see the angiogram in a minute. Uh, should I just go forward to one, the next angiogram because basically you can see that I am pulling back yeah. and that's the sort of speed that I was pulling back at a nice steady pace maybe one or two millimeters a second and so if we go to the physiology screen then what I we wait for it to stabilize for a beat or two we're doing a gentle pull back if it was quite distal so yeah. the jump looks extraordinarily large here but remember the scale yes the scale is only from 1 to 0.8 so we're looking at the top end of the scale and so really that jump is 0.05 which is what we found because the IFR was 0 0.95. It can only go to yeah. 1.0. Exactly. And so although there is a jump around about where the atheroma is, it's not as diffusely diseased a vessel as it might appear. There is spatial resolution to say that the main atheroma is in a quite a focal segment, but that doesn't mean we're going to stent it because, of course, the IFR was negative to start off with. Well, it's very interesting. I mean, so one of the questions people frequently ask is saying, if you make these resting measurements, uh, can you make a pullback recording? And we're going to, be, of course, be covering that in a lot of detail uh, in the latter half of, the, of this uh, demonstration. But one thing you can clearly see on this physiology uh, screen is that even the resting measurements, even when there's a very, very small resting pressure gradient, we are able to extract out a lot of additional information, which is often very, very difficult to, uh, to see uh, and identify uh, when you're using a, a, either a whole cycle uh, analysis technique, either at rest or when you're giving drugs such as adenosine. Often that creates a lot of noise in the system. And it's very difficult to look at small shifts in the pressure gradient. Great, so that, that was the right dealt with. So you decided obviously to leave that. And then we're essentially now we're, we're considering what we're going to do with the left side. And I think we agreed that the pressure wire in those vessels was appropriate. Mm, mm. So I think the next thing we're going to do is going to just talk you through our, our setup in terms of uh, how we uh, 
perform physiology here at the Hammersmith. And always the first thing we're going to do here is to, to make sure that we've zeroed our PA. And I'm, we've done this, of course, before we made those measurements, but I'm just going to go ahead now and ensure that the PA uh, is zero on both the system here and also on the volcano system as well. And that's important because this enables the two systems to talk to one, each other, one another. So if we can open uh, the, uh, the uh, patient to air, please. And the first thing I'll do is I'll ask uh, so our physiologist just to zero this outside. So we'll zero that. You'll see that takes only a second. And then I'll ask uh, David, just leave it zeroed for now. Thank you. I'll ask David just to zero it on the uh, pressure wire boxer as well. And you can see that's gone down to zero. We press done, and now we can open uh, back to the uh, patient again. And then you see our nicely calibrated uh, PA si uh, signals. And of course, now we know that the what's 100 millimeter mercury on the uh, volcano system is 100 millimeter mercury uh, on an, in this case it's a McKeeson physiology system. So next we're going to look at setting up the, uh, the pressure wire. So if we can open the, the pressure wire, that's great. Thanks very much, there, David. That's super. That's great. Okay, so this is the, the uh, Verata pressure wire. comes in a, in a packet like this. And uh, as you see with the, the pressure wire, all the important electrical bits are, thanks very much, are, are isolated. So uh, the, where the connector is is housed within a watertight box. And uh, there are some brief instructions on what to do here. So you've got one, two, and three. So the first thing I'm always going to do with any of these wires is I'm going to plug, I'm going to uh, flush it with some saline. So here's a 10 mil syringe of saline. I'm going to flush that any excess fluid will just run out into this little uh, channel here. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this to uh, my colleague who's going to uh, plug this in for me. And then when that's done, uh, the next thing we'll do is just wait a few seconds as the uh, normalization uh, process begins. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. So during this phase, it's important not to touch. You just leave the uh, pressure wire on the table. It takes a few seconds uh, for the normalization uh, to occur. And uh, once that's occurred, uh, at the bottom it will say that the wire has been uh, prepared and is ready uh, for insertion uh, into the patient. So you can see just in the waiting for zero in the bottom left-hand part of the yeah. screen, yeah. and it's zeroed. We're it's ready zeroed. to go. So that's it takes a couple of seconds. That's it? fantastic. Great. Okay, good. So I, I, we've actually already been using one uh, for this patient, and that's already prepared. So I'm going to carry on using the one we've, we've been using. This was just a demonstration wire. And uh, here we go. So I'm going to pass you uh, this wire. Well, you've got a guide catheter in the, in the left system. And... Uh, I okay, the wire. Thanks guide catheter is in the left system, and you've given nitrates there already. Oh, I've given nitrates. Yeah. Uh, we're obviously heparinized. And we're and heparinized. Uh, uh, now the wire doesn't come with a bend, so I've uh, I've placed a bend on this wire, which is about 30 degrees, just to help us out. Let's see if we can see that bend, by maybe on your back of your hand there. That's great. There we go. So obviously the bend is the most skillful part of angioplasty, as we know. <laughs> Okay. Makes all the difference. And so uh, we've chosen a sort of moderate bend to get us around some of the curves that we need to get to. Remember, it's already gone down that very curvy right coronary artery, yeah. so it is, a, it is okay. a great wire. Great. Okay. So you're going to get that in, and then you're going to stop with the sensor just at the end of the guide catheter. Is that correct? Yeah. And so we can have a look at normalization. Now, normalization uh, is a process, of course, where the aortic and distal uh, wire pressures are normalized so that essentially they're both the same. And there are many ways we can assess which has this been done correctly. We can look at the pressure signal. Uh, we can see whether the ratio is one. So that would be the PDPA ratio is one. I think a very, very important thing to always do is to look at the pressure waveforms themselves. We don't want to have a, a damped pressure waveform because that could imply that you, your catheter is in too far, or it's in some atheroma, or it's in at a funny angle and it's not coaxial. Uh, and you can, to identify this, you're looking for any damping or a very useful trick, as you can see on this slide here, is to identify a pressure notch. So if you can see a, a dichrotic notch or an anachrotic notch in the pressure waveform, that's a good feature to look for. Okay. Okay, so, um, so I've uh, got the, uh, if we look at the angiogram now, the, uh, what we have is a wire that's uh, going down towards the obtuse marginal. Um, I wasn't particularly fussed about which vessel I analyzed yeah. first, so it's decided to go to the OM, so I'm going to accept that. Yeah. And uh, you can see it's not a nice big left main stem, and there is a dichrotic notch on this uh, pressure tracing, so I'm happy that there's no damping occurring with this guide catheter. Very good. So you see the guide there is just 
just in, just out. Well, that's perfect for physiology measurements here. Uh, we've got a nice stable aortic signal. There's, as you said, there's, no, there's a nice notch there as well. So we, we have just normalized there very quickly. What I'll do is I'm just going to repeat that again, just to demonstrate that again. So normalization is simple, takes a few seconds. We hit the normalize button and uh, it takes a few cycles. And this ensures that both the aortic and distal pressures are the same but also uh, that the time shift uh, between the aortic and uh, distal pressure waveforms, the foot of that, is perfectly aligned. So there's no difference uh, uh, between when these two curves start to go up. And that, of course, could be ca caused by an electrical or mechanical delay uh, in the system. So here, we look to have a, both a, a beautiful normalization. So I think it can't be stressed enough that even if the traces look as though they're over each other, then this step is vital, vital. just to make sure that there's no time yep. shift as well. Absolutely right. So you're going to okay. go ahead and advance that beyond that obtuse marginal, we'll, and we'll see what uh, see how many of our colleagues were right in their their predictions. So while Iqbal's was doing that, let, let's just have a, a little think about uh, the whole concept of IFR uh, and essentially why I believe that you know we should really be using physiology uh, day in day out uh, in the cath lab. We make this part of the DNA of uh, of the procedure. And as you can see on the next slide here. Um, one of the problems we have, and perhaps this case illustrates it better than most, is often if you look at an angiogram, where you fire your x-ray beams in really gives you a, a very, very different answer. So in this oval-shaped uh, artery here, you see if we fire them in, in this plane, we, we have the appearance that the artery is very severely diseased. And then if we fire them in from the bottom of the vessel here, you can see that the artery uh, appears not to be as diseased. And of course, this is a, a well-recognized phenomenon. And perhaps you can see that even better if you look at uh, this fly-through OCT image here, where you see, as we fly through the arteries, you see various lumps and bumps, which of course all affect the passage of flow down the vessel they themselves can impair flow traveling and nutrients traveling to the distal myocardium and of course the useful things we can measure both in terms of flow and in the case of IFR or FFR the pressure so we actually make a reference of measuring the pressure beyond all these wiggles in the vessel and comparing that to the aortic pressure and as you can see the next slide with, with IFR uh, essentially we like uh, FFR uh, and all flow based techniques we essentially are making measurements um, which effectively take into account the f uh, anatomy of the whole length of the vessel. The shape of the vessel, uh, the characteristics of the plaque all will differentiate the uh, physiological response. So here you can see two vessels, the same MLA. The top one, the physiology would be very normal. The bottom one, the physiology would be far less normal. And the reason for this is the bottom one, there's a much more pressure loss uh, because you have an irregular stenosis, you have more turbulence, and the flow uh, velocity falls, and the pressure gradient in itself uh, is, is bigger. Now, if we move on, you can see that increasingly, as we are essentially doing in, in cases like this, we're using physiology in much more clever and iterative ways. Uh, the syntax uh, study initially showed us um, in terms of quantifying people by their syntax score, low, medium, high syntax scores. Then we learned if we went on further and used both a combination of physiology and syntax scores, we can reclassify these. And you can see in each of these groups, it's possible to move people from high syntax score to much lower syntax scores and change the proportion of people who would be requiring treatment. And of course, this has very important ramifications for more complex uh, procedures uh, in the cath lab. So, uh, as you can see, three vessel disease can become two vessel disease, two vessel disease, sometimes uh, one vessel disease, and sometimes no vessels need treatment. And studies are looking to uh, formally quantify this at the moment, as has been done in our mini study we presented at the beginning of, of this presentation, but also by colleagues uh, in, in the RIP cord study, and in this uh, case here, the R3F study, Eric Van Bell, who essentially shows us that it's very, very difficult sometimes to classify uh, lesions correctly. Do they benefit from PCI? Would they perhaps be better off with surgery? Or maybe they'd just be better off left alone with medical therapy? So we can see when this is done properly, and uh, you can see from Eric's slide there, that there's a very, very big difference between taking on board physiology 
and uh, ignoring physiology in the cath lab. And here you can see that in this case the FFR was completely disregarded and the, uh, and the mace rate was very, very high. And uh, when you reclassified according to physiology, uh, you can see that uh, the treatment algorithms for both of these two are very, very similar. So this is, this is uh, indeed very, very uh, encouraging. Now, the strategy with, with IFR-based techniques is, is essentially always to uh, build uh, the uh, process whereby we simplify physiology and we make it easier and easier for people to, to make measurements in the cath lab, again using a pressure wire, using a, a similar technique. So, Iqbal, you've now got this wire down. Okay, so I think it is. Uh, I think it is interesting, isn't it? Because on that angiographic view, uh, on that angiographic view, uh, uh, on that angiographic view, I think we have a, a situation where uh, it looks quite tight, doesn't it? Yep. Okay, but we know that our eyes can be misled. They're drawn to an area which is less dense, especially in bifurcations, and so. This pressure wire has now gone down, and if we go to the physiology screen, uh, we can see that on the angiogram, the wire is a couple of lesion lengths beyond, which I think is important. Yeah. Okay, It's sitting in a normalish segment, which I think is important. The guide catheter is not shoved too far in, which is important. So this should be giving us a good physiology reading. And of course, we are always surprised by what we see, because we look at that PDPA ratio, and it's not going to be strikingly abnormal, is it? I think we know before we make any measurements, it's unlikely that this is going to be a physiologically significant lesion. And, of course, what we've learned over doing so much physiology is that we have to believe the physiology rather than relying on the old angiogram, which we know was flawed. We knew that, and, and indeed, that, you know, as more and more data comes out, we know that people who tend to have events and tend to have physiology which is very, very significant. So typically, you're talking about having an FFR value of as low as 0.66 is where the trade-off you know, between medical therapy and when people really start having events occurs. And of course, this is what has been explored a lot in the large physiology studies. So you, as you say, well, here the, the PDPA is uh, very normal at 0.97. Now, on this console, we also have the luxury, this is a, the latest console, of having a, a live beat-by-beat -beat updated uh, IFR measurement. Uh, and this is done on the fly. Essentially, you see every single beat, uh, the PDPA value will change slightly, the IFR value will change very, very slightly. But it gives us a, a value, which, of course, is absolutely essential if we're going to be going on to perform a pullback assessment. So once you've got your wire down there, essentially it's just a question of, of pushing the record so button. So we just need to push the record button. We want to take an IFR reading. It will take three beats or so, so let's press the button. Okay, so that's taken us three seconds, and it's given us a reading of 0 0.95. As okay. expected, that is negative. Okay, let's have a look at that recording again. That, that's a very nice illustration of uh, what, what we just... Uh, that's great. That's a very, very nice illustration. Um, you can see in this case here that uh, the wave-free period, this is the phase where we assess uh, the coronary physiology, is uh, marked out very, very clearly using a green line which superimposes over the yellow, which is the, uh, the, the distal wire pressure, and the red, the aortic line. And you can see in this case, it's a beautiful recording. Uh, the computer's correctly detected the wave-free period on every single one of these beats, and that's where it essentially performs the analysis over it. Now why does it choose this phase? It chooses this phase because this is when flow is highest and it gives us the most sensitivity and resistance is most stable and lowest. And it's absolutely critically important and the key difference here really between uh, whole cycle based techniques such as FFR and PDPA because to make those measurements you have to average at over at least one cardiac cycle and it's typically three to five beats. Now clearly here you can average just over that wave free period and the reason we can do this is because over this period the resistance is absolutely stable. So this has very, very important ramifications for when we're doing pullback analyses because it enables us to look at large step-ups and large gradients as they occur uh, with very high uh, degree of spatial resolution. So you can see actually on the slide here now that the, this is a, a, an illustration of flow, PD and PA pressures and resistance. And you can see, most importantly, the bottom slide here shows you this key difference between uh, IFR and whole cycle based uh, analysis techniques. So IFR, there's a rise in the resistance during systole, and then it falls away, and then you have this plateau phase. 
Now the plateau phase is low and stable, and this is the IFR resistance. This is where we actually make our measurement of, uh, of IFR. Now if you want to make a measurement of FFR, or PDPA, you, because that resistance is so variable over the whole cardiac cycle, you need to average over at least one beat. And as I said, to avoid a lot of variability, typically that's done over, over three beats. And often to reduce the magnitude of that variability, as you can see in this case here, it's done with the use of, of an adenosine infusion to make the resistance uh, very stable. So, so you've made this measurement. Uh, now you're going to, I suppose, I, th I think we should, we should pull back, yeah, pull uh, because back. I have to take the wire back, and yeah. I think uh, I would do this routinely anyway. Yeah. We can do it on a pullback recording yeah. Yeah. on this occasion, but even if I wasn't doing it, then I would make sure that m I had had no drift yeah. by putting the sensor back in the left main stem. Yeah. So we might as well do that on pullback, so uh, let's do a pullback. So flick to the pullback mode here. So, so we're routinely finding we're using this pullback mode. Very, very simple and easy to do. Uh, wait a few beats to the blue line starts to, to come up and then you'll see Iqbal will just very slowly pull this back down the length of the vessel uh, and you'll see the blue line represents uh, a trend line. We're coming now through the, the narrowing, you can see there's a step up there as one would expect. But it, amongst this you can see there's also a little bit of diffuse atheromatous type disease which uh, exists as well. If you stop there that's great. Okay great, so here we go, we, we stepped up through that vessel, you uh, received it reached another little plateau, then it stepped up again. But these are very, very, very small uh, step ups. And, and if you can try and quantify this, this is in the order of around 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 in a, of an improvement in IFR if you stent that. So it's very, very small. And more than likely reflects a very small territory which, which this vessel supplies. And I think we also saw that well, that first step up was exactly where we'd have expected yeah. that tighter part. It turns out not to be tight, doesn't it, on yeah. physiology, but the tighter bit on angiography. Can we go live for a second? Because I've now got the, uh, the sensor in the left main stem. And just as a double check, yeah. I want to be sure that the PDPA is pretty much one. Yeah. And indeed it is. The yeah. traces are almost overlying each other. So there hasn't been any significant drift. Yeah. So I'm happy that that was a genuine reading, that my eyes deceived me, and that the physiology has saved this chap a stent. No, absolutely. This is, ju this is good uh, use of physiology. Uh, and as you say, uh, our eyes can often be deceptive. But we know from the measurements in the literature that stenting lesions which are not flow limiting don't result in improvement in flow. So it's likely that we go to all the effort of implanting a stent here with little benefit to our patients. So, so while Sigbal moves ahead now and, and starts wiring another vessel, of course we're looking at this uh, whole analysis technique uh, in a number of big studies at the moment. There's uh, Syntex 2 study uh, and FAME 3 study. The Syntex 2 study is a very exciting study which is uh, more than halfway through uh, enrollment at the moment. And this builds on the original Syntex study where it takes people with uh, multi-vessel disease uh, and uh, it essentially says rather than just putting stents in where we see the lesions, we're going to interrogate these lesions using physiology and only treat the arteries which actually have very tight uh, lesions. So you can see it uses a, an FFR, IFR approach. So this is a so-called hybrid approach, which is an approach we were really advocating a couple of years ago now. Uh, but of course, this is when the study was designed. And this allows us to spare adenosine, we know, from two large studies in around about 70% of patients, and perhaps even more in a group of patients uh, it, who have severe uh, three-vessel disease. Put simply, if the IFR is more than 0.93, this patient's vessel is not treated. If it's less than 0.86, it is treated, and in the grey zone there, the patient undergoes uh, an FFR measurement. We then implant modern uh, drug-eluting synergy stents, and then we IVUS optimise everything. So we make sure we give the patient the best chance of uh, doing, doing well, and hopefully having a relief from their anginal symptoms whilst minimising the stent implantations. Good. So, so you're okay. So you're I've I've now put the 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 distal tip of the wire into the LAD. Yeah. And I think why don't we do it exactly as we would do yeah. it for a fresh vessel? Yeah. The needle introducer has come back. I'm in the left main stem with my sensor. I want to normalise again, okay. just to be absolutely sure that we're in in good shape with this wire. So let's normalise. Okay, and so again, it's going to be three seconds or so, uh, and we're ready to go. The PDPA is one, the IFR is one. I'm happy with this. Yep. Okay, so now it's a mishmash of overlapping branches here, and so uh, I think that sort of 
uh, 40, uh, so 1540 view was probably the best view. So if we go to that view and put the roadmap of that up, uh, then we'll try and get it down either the LED or the diagonal, whichever one it wants to okay. go down first. So while you do that, I'm, I've got a question which I'll just address here. So um, the question is, if you give nitrates or heparin and you're making a measurement of IFR, because of course this is a resting measurement, how long do you have to wait? Well, typically with, with nitrates, most of the effect is on the epicardial vessel. And this takes 20 to 30 seconds to maximize its effect. And there's also a very mild hyperemic effect. Okay, and this maybe takes 15 or 20 seconds to wear off as well. Similarly with heparin, similarly with, with contrast or saline. Nitrates, are, of course, have two effects. One, they'll cause this mild hyperemia. But they also have this more longer lasting effect of causing the epicardial artery to dilate as well. And of course, as we saw from the right coronary artery, this is a very, very important thing to do. Now, as well as the, the Syntex 2 study, uh, another study which uh, is underway at the moment, again looking at IFR and FFR, is the Defined Flare study. Now, in some ways, this is similar to Syntex 2, uh, and in other ways, uh, it, it's different from Syntex 2. It's similar because eventually we can take people with, with multivessel disease. But how it differs is this is very, very much uh, a, a normal clinical working practice uh, study. So essentially, all of the uh, operators from around the world are essentially asked to treat your patients as you would do normally, put patients in who you would normally assess from a physiological perspective. And it's a very large study. So it's, uh, this study on its own is 2,500 patients. So to give you some metric, that's twice as large as FAME. And uh, it's a study which is, on, from a headline basis, is comparing an IFR-only strategy against an FFR-only strategy. So essentially, it's using a single cut point of less than 0.9 for IFR and a great, a less than or equal to 0.80 for FFR. But of course, in addition to this, within this study, there's going to be some really useful information. We're going to have a whole load of patients who, who have uh, acute coronary syndromes, and we're using the pressure wire just in the non-culprit vessel both for FFR and IFR. We're also going to be measuring the physiology after the stent goes in to see if that relates to clinical outcomes afterwards. And of course, we're even within the FFR um, alone, because it's so big, in there we're going to essentially have a, a defer type study and a FAMES type study all, all, all there. And the, the really potentially useful thing for this clinical trial is that the distribution of patients is all going to be within a normal distribution centered around the clinical population that's evaluated day by day in the cardiac cath lab. So it's very exciting. And uh, so this study, uh, essentially, as I said, is large, 2,500 patients, multi-center, uh, international study, and really looking at hard clinical endpoint differences between the techniques and also uh, cost effectiveness. This is one of the studies in this area. There's another study which is being run by Matthias Gottberg uh, in Sweden, which is uh, part of uh, called the IFR uh, Sweetheart study. Again, a huge study, 2,000 patients, very similar study design, um, very similar endpoints. And as I said, all the Swedish uh, investigators are involved with that, led by uh, Matthias. So, Igor, there's a couple of the studies we're, we're involved with at the moment. You're, you're down... Uh, right, so uh, this has gone down the diagonal. Go back a shot, please. Yeah. Uh, so if you can go back a short tune. So I think that tells us we're down the diagonal branch and we can see perhaps slightly more clearly now with the wire stabilizing things that there is some sort of plaque at the top end. So I think I'd be very interested by what the physiology shows. Yeah. So let's go to the physiology screen. Okay, and so I think we can see on the physiology screen that uh, I'm going to be disappointed about putting a stent in this one now as well. We're not going to be putting too many stents in today. And so this uh, IFR's saying 0 0.97, 0 0.98. The traces are almost overlying. And I've been watching that while you've been talking. It's been pretty stable like that. So um, I think I'm happy to take a reading here. Okay. I, won't, I won't bother with a pullback because there's almost no gradient. No. But uh, let's take a reading so that we've got it documented what the IFR actually is. And it's 0 0.97, which is what I would expect. But I would want to be sure again that the there was no drift, yep. and so we're going to pull the wire back. Okay, uh, it, it's probably worth making a point that the needle introducer has been back for every single one of these readings. Yep. Now I know that our South Korean colleagues have decided that, in fact, if you do everything with the introducer in, 
then that's fine as well. Yep. But actually, just uh, for this educational purpose, I'm doing everything with Introducer Out. So, so I, th I think that's the, a good point for me. Well, there are many ways of doing things, of course, in the CAS lab, but w the way, w and it's very much the way we do things in the protocol here and, and encourage people to do in, in our training courses, essentially always to have a standardized approach using the uh, needle, with uh, withdrawing the needle Introducer to make sure you never forget to uh, push it in or out. Okay, so uh, so we've got a little bit of drift. I don't think it would clinically make that much difference. It's uh, 0.03 um, uh, of drift. We'll give a, should we give a little flush just to see? So we flush that just to yeah. see if there is any uh, contrast there which is uh, causing that difference. Sometimes that's the case. We'll see if that makes any difference. It takes a few seconds just for the averaging process to take part. Take part. But it's, it's about the same. So I'm, I'm very happy just to uh, renormalize yep. and then pop the wire back down again. Yep. You know, it's very easy to do. Let's so do let's renormalize. Okay, so let's renormalize. So I think that kind of mild level of drift, you know, uh, in my experience happens with all the pressure wires mm. uh, on the market. Um, and I think that it's just something more more than anything that you just need to be very much alerted to. Uh, the fact that uh, if you're making measurements, you're looking for to make precise uh, measurements in the vessel, you can always make sure that you check at the end that there's there's no drift there because this potentially could change uh, the categorization of the patient from a stent to no stent uh, or, or vice versa. So having certainty uh, is clearly important. So as Iqbal said, it only takes a few seconds to, to position the wire back down uh, the vessel. Uh, just to double check to make sure everything uh, looks good and uh, as soon as that is done uh, we can go ahead and uh, and make our measurements but uh, just going to a side branch of that diagonal we'll find our way through again eventually yeah so I think that, here we go, Iqbal's okay. he's down there, maybe a little bit further down uh, than before, but we'll see now. So remember that the drift we had there was slightly higher, so it was 1.03, so that would mean that the number we expect to see is much more within uh, uh, the grey zone area, should I say, with regards to any physiology value uh, moving forward. So here you can see Iqbal's just given a little bit of contrast. You have a mild hyperemic response. As I said, it lasts a few seconds, maybe up to 20 seconds. And uh, you can now see that the, the values are starting to normalize again. And as we'd expect, we had a little bit of drift before. And uh, you can see that when the things come back to normal, we'd expect this to settle uh, a little bit lower than our original values were uh, from a few seconds ago. So we had a value, I think, of before of 0.93. Mm. We had 1.03 uh, of our normalization. Can we flush through with saline? Okay, so just uh, give it a flush through with saline. Okay, that's great. And we'll let everything settle down now. So there you go. So it's again within this you know, negative range. Let's just go ahead and make a, make a measurement there, please, David. As I said, we would expect this to be a little bit lower. Point 0.92, so it's you know, almost the same. It was 0.93 before, it's 0.92 uh, now. Okay, so um, we've got adenosine attached up. Do you think it'd be worthwhile demonstrating whether the um, adenosine would make any difference yeah. here? I, I think this is likely to be negative, but yeah. when we were talking about the studies, uh, obviously in one of them there was a binary cutter of 0 0.9 uh, or 0 0.89, and the other one there was a grey zone. Sure. And so we're, we're set up to do it, and if we have the time, uh, yeah. then we could just give some adenosine. So uh, what I suggest we do, if we switch, switch the FFR mode, as Iqbal said, it's, very, it's in the grey zone, this, uh, we're waiting for the clinical outcome data is very likely to be negative as well with, with the FFR measurement. We'll make an FFR measurement and while we're doing that we'll just go ahead to look at uh, some more pullback data uh, which we have in terms of uh, an interesting case presentation. As is ever the case with, uh, with coronary physiology you often have 
differences between the anatomy uh, and the physiology and uh, you know we can often see cases where we have more extensive disease like this less intermediate disease which uh, potentially could give us a uh, substrate for assessment of the pullback in other ways so a very interesting case presentation I'll, I'll share with you now which is of an 85 year old gentleman who had a came in with a mildly elevated troponin diffusely ectatic uh, LED vessel uh, with uh, serial lesions in it this was just from a few weeks ago using, using the very same console. And if we, if we move ahead now, you'll see that uh, in this case, uh, the vessel here, unsurprisingly, was very, very significant. You see a resting PDPA of 0.79, an IFR much lower of 0.72. And the next thing my colleague uh, Rafi Kaprilian did here is realized this was a very significant value. He, he identified here that 0.72 was well below the threshold of, of less than 0.90. He identified that those were nice traces, so you can see the wave-free period, and then essentially went ahead uh, to uh, measure using the, uh, the IFR pullback. So if we show you the IFR pullback, again, it's similar to you've seen here in uh, the, the right coronary artery in the immature marginal. We just start the recording. We're pulling back very gradually, very slowly along the length of the vessel. And as we do so, and as we go through uh, areas of atheroma, where areas of more mild to moderate or severe disease, you can see that the blue line responds uh, appropriately. Now keep your eyes on the PDPA and IFR values. You see the PDPA there is about 0.82, the IFR is 0.77. Now when we go through this deletion, you'll see within one beat, there you go, the IFR has gone to 0.98. The PDPA is still creeping up over two or three beats. Now you can also see here that the uh, there's been an ectopic beat which has caused the trace to shift up and go abnormally high. But one of the great things about this new software is essentially error corrects for that and you can see it's removed this ectopic beat uh, from the analysis and we're left with a beautiful smooth uh, curve. So let's have a look what happened in this case. You can see uh, he, the next thing he did was just to test how reproducible this technique was. So this is one of the first cases we had done. And you could see uh, in this case, he just did exactly the same again. So the wire was down, just pulled the wire back very, very gradually uh, over a few, a few seconds. Um, the speed, typically 15 to 20 seconds, you're pulling it back. Same kind of speed as you'd pull back an FFR pullback with or an IVUS pullback with. Again, you can see the same picture. So we have this diffuse disease. Then we have a more severe, uh, more focal disease. And then after that, uh, we have uh, the... Uh, the uh, the, the line flattening off once again. Let's jump ahead to the next slide. Uh, so, so let's compare those two uh, side by side if we may. Uh, that's certainly showing us diffuse, focal, more diffuse again. And now let's uh, jump ahead. And here we see, uh, uh, this is actually, this is the reproducibility slide. Please forgive me. The previous one was a, just a, a rerun of the original slide. And here you can see, uh, again, as I said, a reproducible uh, uh, value. The other one was 100% reproducible. I think it was the same same recording. This is definitely uh, I'm uh, told a different one, and you can see it coming back now. Yes, this is definitely a different recording. We've got a little bit of artifact there from an ectopic beat, uh, and he's again coming through diffuse plaque, more severe plaque coming shortly, and uh, then we'll slowly come up to the proximal part of the vessel. When you compare these two side by side, these two runs, you can see that we're actually left. Uh, with the two traces which look remarkably similar to one another you have all the features diffuse focal diffuse again and if you move to the next slide you'll see that actually it's possible with these just to even superimpose one curve over another so they both fit beautifully together and shows that far from uh, what's frequently thought that resting physiology ha actually has very high levels of reproducibility now using this we can predict the likely improvement in function so here you can see that big step up occurs uh, in the latter part of that vessel we have that big vertical takeoff essentially this would increase the IFR value if we put a stent there and if we move ahead you'll see w uh, how we can effectively model this by essentially stenting in that location and essentially it lifts the whole of the pressure curve up to a new position. So in this case, it's lifting it from around about 0.73, and if we move ahead, to around about 0.91, 0.92. So we went ahead in this case here, we, we stented, and if we move ahead, you'll see that after the stent goes in, move, keep moving ahead, you'll see that uh, the, the value was repeated, and we're left with an IFR value, which is uh, very similar to what uh, we predicted would happen. 
So that's, a, that's an illustrative case there uh, of uh, physiology uh, in real clinical practice. This was an acute coronary syndrome patient, real world practice. It was helping us to judge where best to implant our stent. Elderly gentleman didn't want to put in lots and lots of stents, and it really helped us to direct things focally. So, Iqbal, in this time, you've, you've gone ahead, you've made a measurement in the Yeah, so diagonal. I've made a, made a measurement in the diagonal with FFR. So yeah. we've given 140 micrograms per kilogram per minute. You could give intracoronary, but we've got a venous lining in a large bore central vein, and we've given the adenosine that way. And we've waited for a minute and a half. So let me show you the physiology traces. It produced a pretty stable reading of an FFR of 0 0.95. Sometimes we see variation, don't we, in mm -hmm. FFR. It yo-yos up and down, but this was pretty steady. And if we go sliding the ruler towards the end of the time period. So, uh, David, could we just slide the uh, ruler across to the end time period? Uh, then we'll see what it was like at the end of the minute or so. Uh, so keep on going. So you can see it's, it's pretty, pretty steady stable, all the way. It? Yeah. And it's 0 0.95. So the FFR is 0 0.95. I think no one in their right mind would want to stent that. The IFR was negative. And so whatever the angiogram shows, we know that this patient would not be served, either from symptoms or prognosis, by putting a stent into that diagonal branch. Absolutely. So uh, I've also taken the liberty of now putting the yep. uh, sensor down into the LAD, yep. because that's the last vessel we're going to analyze. So can we go live, please? Okay, so now we're w it's down in the LAD. There's a little bit of shatter. Let me ju look, just before you move anything, let's have a look at the physiology trace. This is very interesting. Now, often these kind of problems get reported as uh, being uh, wire wire related issues or connector problems, and you can see these spikes occurring mm. uh, on this trace here. And uh, this is not that. This no. is caused by the actual little sensor itself hitting, the, striking yeah. the wall, isn't it? So it's banging against the against the side wall. So and what so would you do here? Well, I'm just going to pull the wire back just a fraction and that should iron that problem out. So we're still well beyond the lesion. There you go. And there you go, the physiology has settled itself down and I'm very happy with that tracing. Now, I want to take the needle introducer back. Now, maybe it's worthwhile seeing if it makes any difference. So uh, here's the tracing with the needle introducer in. Yep. Okay, and I'm now going to take the needle introducer back. Make sure my wire's in a similar position, which it is there. So, yeah, as you've normalized with the needle introducer out, you have to always remember, of exactly. course, to do that. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a measurement there, David, of the, uh, the IFR. If you just press record, press that super. Okay, so this is, this is, I can see from an interventional perspective, there's more of a smile on the face now, because this is coming towards the, the territory which we know uh, is positive. So less than, less than 0.9 for our IFR, we know from data from around about uh, 3,000 uh, patients, uh, gives us a, a value which is equivalent of an FFR of less than or equal to 0.80. And that's certainly what we're using in all the big clinical uh, outcome studies at the moment. Maybe in this case it will be, again, interesting to, uh, to do a pullback. Yeah, pull, okay. Pull well, back first. We yeah. can do a pullback and then I, we can uh, try and give some adenosine uh, yeah. and see whether that would make a difference. Um, it's slightly difficult to wire the distal LAD uh, uh, because there are multiple branches coming off on a bend. Okay. So shall we do the uh, FFR and then do the pullback? I would do, uh, I would do the pullback pull first, okay, just because we're a little bit short of time. Okay, so and let's do uh, that. I think that uh, we can do that, and then we can, okay, we can so come back to the FFR in the end. So here's the pullback. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm just going to gently roll it backwards. And it's around about now that we're going to cross the diagonal bifurcation. And now we're in the proximal LAD. And now we're in the left main stem. Okay. So we probably pause it there. Okay, let's pause there. So uh, we can see, interestingly, uh, again, from that result you see there, it's not a big step up like we saw in that nice yeah. case a minute a minute ago. And even it's not as discreet as in the right coronary artery, which you showed us, or the chief module, where you did see a step up, albeit it was small. Here you see there's more of a diffuse, Very diffuse pattern, pattern. Absolutely. along the length of the vessel. Mm. And perhaps that means if, you, if you're going to put a stent in here, you need to be thinking perhaps going a little bit longer rather yeah. than, than, than shorter. Maybe we could, maybe you, I can leave you to just check everything's all right at that end. And I'm just going to review, as often the case when we have questions about this, uh, with regards to why you can make measurements uh, using... Uh, 
uh, IFR under resting conditions and, and why it's potentially problematic with FFR under hyperemic conditions. And as I said, I'll, I'll leave Iqbal just to, to do the graft and essentially to uh, go back down, measure the FFR, see what we get with the FFR in this case, and then obviously plan if we're going to go ahead and put a stent implantation uh, in here. So with the IFR pullback, uh, you've seen a, a beautiful case uh, demonstrated, a negative case here, uh, and you've seen a lovely uh, positive case previously. We, we make use of the fact that when we're assessing uh, arteries of different uh, severities uh, in terms of the angiographic stenosis, that coronary blood flow under hyperemic conditions is very, very dependent on the stenosis severity. So if you have uh, a mild stenosis, flow is high. At about 50%, it starts to fall. And then as we go down to uh, around about 100%, uh, then it starts to course fall off uh, significantly. Now, if we now look at uh, the uh, condition where we have two different uh, stenoses within an artery. So flow you see here is low because we have two quite tight lesions. Now if we were to put a stent in, what happens to the flow in this case? It increases and it increases significantly. And this means that if we were to continue to measure uh, flow or in, in case of hyperemic pressure measurements such as FFR, because the flow is higher, the FFR could be unchanged even as a result of stenting or it could even be lower. Now it's very interesting as we use the IFR Scout more, this is a, something, a realization which is coming to many of us that actually when we don't see an improvement in physiology, when we don't, we don't make a measurement, an IFR Scout pullback measurement, it may actually be in many cases that we're actually stenting an angiographically significant lesion and actually missing the key target. Now, with rest uh, physiology, you see that things really are very, very different. You can see uh, that across the whole range of stenosis severities, up to about 90%, that rest flow is very, very constant. Now, if we have that same scenario again, whereby the, there's a tight lesion, and, uh, or type 2 lesions, we put one stent in, you can see that there is an increase in flow with IFR when it goes from a very tight lesion to a less tight lesion, but the increase in flow is tiny. And essentially what this means, it means that we have very little crosstalk or interaction between most of the stenoses which we interrogate in clinical practice. Now Dr. Nidja uh, and uh, colleagues have investigated this formally and uh, you can see in this study he rigorously assessed uh, this in 32 uh, patients, did an IFR pullback, predicted the likely improvement, then implanted a stent and then they measured afterwards and what they found is that the predicted IFR was 0 0.94, the observed IFR was 0 0.93 and of course there was no significant difference uh, between uh, the two of these. Now the future of uh, these pullback recordings is, is changing rapidly. You can see already we have the ability now to make very, very accurate uh, IFR recordings uh, in the cath lab under uh, basal conditions. We can now make them using a, a pullback recording, as you see, uh, have seen today, uh, and you can see on the slide here. But really, the, 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 the golden uh, nugget at the end of the, uh, the rainbow, really, for us from an interventional perspective, is to be able to fuse the angiography images with the physiology images to give us essentially a, a, a multimodality map. And this is a technology which is currently under development and, and it's very imp exciting to be part of. Essentially what this does is as the wire is being pulled back down the length of the artery, it tracks, the computer tracks the sensor of the pressure wire at each location. And in doing so, it records the IFR value at each location along the vessel. Now the other really uh, fantastic thing which it can do is as it can measure where the location of the sensor is in the vessel and it measures it as you pull back, it can also calculate out the, the distance. And in doing so, it can give us the gradient. And this is really a measure of how much energy is being lost per millimeter. So if you have a very focal stenosis, there's a lot of energy lost per millimeter. If it's less focal, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, more energy loss per millimetre. And you can see in this map here, we illustrate uh, lots of energy loss by lots of those yellow balls and less, more diffuse disease by fewer of those balls. And if you incorporate this into an online system, have the ability to put virtual stents in, as we've seen uh, in the recorded case, very, very easy to plan your PCI and enable you to predict the light improvements after doing the pullback, you know, prior to even opening up a balloon uh, or stent. 
So I think we're coming towards the end of, of the session today. So you've done the, the I've uh, done the I've done the FFR. So let's go to the physiology yeah. screen to try and wrap this case up. And so uh, we know that the uh, IFR reading uh, was 0.89. Yep. And so it's in the grey zone. And yep. so we've done the FFR. The FFR is 0.86. And so it's taken some time to get up to 0.86. It took over a minute and a half before anything really happened, despite a central vein. Uh, negative. I think I'd be leaving it. Fine. So we've, this is a very interesting case. We've, we've essentially seen in this, this case here that you, you essentially taken someone who angiographically was seen with you know, diffuse disease and we were thinking about putting you know, two, three, four stents in and we've essentially taken that patient and we've assessed things physiologically and uh, we've essentially used uh, the physiology, as you see on the screen here, uh, to help us really guide uh, therapy. So I'd just like to, uh, to close out now, and if we can uh, have the opportunity to thank all the members of the team. Obviously, I'd like to thank Dr. Malik for, for doing most of the hard work today. We've, we've got key members of the nursing, nursing staff uh, and support team here as well. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the back end running all the show today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Suk Nidja, who's an interventional cardiologist, also with fantastic IT skills, who's, who's helping out Judith Feingold, Rasha al uh, Dr. Sian Sen, all the team, uh, very important here in Imperial uh, in making uh, things work. I hope you've really enjoyed uh, this uh, showcase today of uh, technology. Uh, it's certainly been our pleasure bringing it to you, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, you have the opportunity uh, in some stage uh, in the near future to use these technologies um, in your lab. I can certainly say that in the two or three weeks that we've had the ability to use uh, IFR Scout, that every single one of my uh, colleagues uh, here has been using it in every single case they perform a physiological assessment in. It really is a truly useful uh, tool and it enables us to not just uh, guess uh, where the location is uh, or which the, in the vessel where the stent would uh, uh, be most beneficial, but actually measure it. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Great. June, can Sound you off?